Well, 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 welcome again, everyone, to our online church, The Soapbox. Last time we discussed the fruit of the Spirit in preview. Today, we would like to hone in on each specific fruit, starting with love. So, John, you mentioned last time that it is significant that love is the first one listed. How important is love to the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, thanks, and also, yeah, last time we did talk about the fruit of the Spirit, just previewed the whole thing, what it is, how we can have it. So, yeah, as you mentioned, just like to look a bit more specifically at each one. So today um, we'll look at love, the first one. And I think it is it is significant that the Lord starts his list with love. Uh, really is the, the number one thing. If you've got love, pretty much everything else sort of falls into place. And I've just got a few scriptures to share that show how important love is. And I don't know if you've sort of noticed, but John's gospel in particular, and, you know, he, he follows it up in his epistles as well, has a big emphasis on love. And I don't think that that's um, coincidental as well, that it talks about how that John was the one whom Jesus loved. Not that he didn't love the others, but John was special to the Lord. So John does get inspired, I think, it seems to talk a lot more about love. So, you know, these scriptures I've got are from the Gospel of John and also the Epistles of John. The first one from the Epistle, 1 John 4, verse 8. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. Wow, that, that's sort of pretty hard hitting, isn't it? You know, as, as Christians, we are to be people of love. And if, we, if we're not, then the Lord is saying, listen, you don't know me um, because I'm, I'm love. You know, it doesn't say God has love. It says God is love. That's what he's, he's made up of. Again, from John's epistles, 1 John 4, verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. So there again, showing that loving one another is, is key. It, it, it's, it's imperative. Again, 1 John 4, verse 16 this time, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. There it is again. And he that dwells in God and God in him. So again, having love determines whether we're in God and God is, is in us. And in the same chapter, verse 20, if a man says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. He's a liar. You know, I don't know how many churches, I mean, our church hasn't been immune um, from this over the years, where people don't really love the brethren, and it causes all sorts of problems. And as it turns out, those people end up showing their true colors and they actually show that they're not in God because that scripture clearly says if you hate your brother you're a liar if you say you love God you cannot say you love God if you don't love your brother first for he that does not love his brother who he has seen how can he love God whom he has not seen you see so you know it can be a bit of a cop out for the flesh to say oh yeah I love God he's amazing because you know, you can't see them. But what about our brethren who we can see? You know, we're expected to show love to them. And John 13, verse 35, John, uh, John records Jesus saying there, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. You know, this is the, the number one sign that, people are going to see, the Lord is saying, if you have love one for another. So it's a, it's a pretty fundamental subject. Mm. So, John, can love ironically be selfish? Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because, you know, we know that love isn't selfish. But I, I just want to share a couple of examples where our love actually can be selfishly motivated. Uh, most of you have heard of the love languages um, in Christian circles. 
Uh, it's a, a well-known book that's been around for decades now, and it talks about the, the different love languages. It, it lists one, two, three, four, five of them. Um, quality time, words of affirmation, gifts, number four, acts of service, and number five, physical touch. And uh, I think there's, there's value in the book and there's value in thinking about this. And basically the thrust of the book is saying, listen, people have different love languages. In other words, people, some people like gifts. And therefore, you know, if, if you're not giving them gifts, then they don't feel loved. Or for, for other people, it's quality time. If you're not spending quality time with them, even though you might show your love by giving gifts, then they don't feel loved. And there's a brother in our church, Morris Clark, he actually gave a series of talks on this recently, and um, he did, did very well, I might say. And he made the point that God, God actually uses all of these five things. Now, the reason that I suggest that love can be selfish in relation to this is, let's say your love language is words of affirmation. In other words, for you, unless people are always saying to you, oh, man, you did such a great job there, you're wonderful, unless you're receiving that, then you're not feeling loved. Then what happens if people don't know that, or even if they do know that, but they perhaps just don't think about it, and they give you a gift because they want to show you love? Are you going to feel like they don't love you? And if you do, that's selfish because that person or those people are actually showing you love and, you know, you need to acknowledge, well, that's their way of showing me love. You see, we very quickly default to our way. Unless I'm getting love the way I want to get it, then it's not love. And so, you know, the... the the way love looks, it can be selfish if we're looking at it like that. We need to actually rather say, listen, that person has given me a gift. Now, gifts don't really spin my wheels, but they were really trying to show me love and acknowledge that that, that has been love given to me. So, so I hope you, you understand that. Another example I want to share is, is from the, the story of Saul, King Saul in the Bible, and David. Now, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and I'm just going to read from verse 14, it says, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Prior to that, in chapter 15, Saul had disobeyed God. He was told to kill all the Amalekites, to kill all the animals. And remember, he kept some of the animals to be a sacrifice. Um, he didn't kill all the people. And you know he was told, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and as a result of that he, he showed his true colors his disobedience so God withdrew his spirit from him through through the prophet Samuel and so the Lord had departed and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him interesting that isn't it you know in, in Christian circles there is this view these days that evil spirits are a evil supernatural being, you know, from the devil, well, God sent this evil spirit because there's no such thing as a as a rival evil supernatural being. Good and evil all come from God. So anyway, God sent Saul an evil spirit, which troubled him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold, an evil spirit from God troubles you. Let our Lord now command your servants to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit of God is upon you, that he shall play with his hand and you shall be well. Now, this evil spirit, I believe, was, was basically Saul's own evil spirit. I think we discussed last week, there's only two spirits. There's God's Holy Spirit and there's the human spirit. And so because God hath, had withdrawn his Holy Spirit, Saul was left to his own devices. And naturally speaking, he was a jealous, angry, paranoid 
sort of man. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. He's cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man, a man of war, prudent in matters and a comely person. And the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messages to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass, laid him with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David, his son, unto Saul. And David came to Saul, stood before him, and he loved him greatly. That is, Saul loved David greatly, and David became his armor bearer. Okay, so David's good on the harp. He gets noticed. He gets found. He gets appointed to be Saul's personal musician to try and cheer Saul up. And it says that Saul loved him, loved him greatly. Okay. Now, then you go into chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, where David um, kills Goliath. And in verse 58, 1 Samuel 17, verse 58, Saul says to him, because David kills Goliath and then he gets brought before Saul, Saul says to him, says to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, the Bethlehemite. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but it's strange because in chapter 16, David is the personal musician of Saul and it says Saul loved him greatly. The very next chapter, when David has killed Goliath, Saul doesn't seem to know who he is. And to me, the explanation for this is, as I mentioned, Saul was a very proud, self-centered, jealous sort of person. And although it says he loved David greatly, I don't actually think he even really noticed David. He loved David, in other words, for what he was getting out of David, because he was playing skillfully, making Saul feel better, but he actually didn't really love the, the person. He didn't even know actually who David was. And you know, you may think this is a bit strange, but we can be the same. We can love our spouse, we can love our friend, even God, for what we can get out of them. In other words, it can be a selfish sort of love. And we're going to see shortly that that's not true love. True love is, is sacrificial. True love notices people. You know, it's, it's not just loving somebody or loving something, like I say, including God, for what we can get out of it. Mm. So, John, the Bible in the original language uses more than one word for love. Can you explain those for us? Yeah, I love the way other languages and, and French, for example, is, is similar. Um, other languages have different words for different types of love, whereas, you know, we in our English language, the word love, um, we love cups of tea, we love holidays, we love our wife, we love God. It's all one word, and it, it doesn't really differentiate, you know, the different levels of love. Now, in the Hebrew there is basically just one word which, which covers all of those um, all of those types of love in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there are two uh, main words used. The first one is agape. You've probably heard that that Greek word. I've got to say, there's a lot made of that word in Christian circles to to try and define it as this amazing sacrificial, you know, God's love sort of type of love. But in actual fact, the word agape is used very broadly, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. The second word in the New Testament is, is philia or filio, um, just variations on the same. And that word means a, a brotherly affection, 
a fondness, okay? Now, the word agape is pretty much the same as the Hebrew word love. It's used generally of many different types of love. Um, it's used for the love for God. In other words, you know, the greatest commandment in Matthew 22, verse 37, to love God with all our heart. So that's agape. It's used as the love we're to have for our neighbor. Again, the second great commandment, the royal commandment, Matthew 22, verse 39, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's agape. It's used for the love of God. So not our love for God, but the love of God for us. Romans 5, verse 5 is an example of that. But it's even used of the love of the Pharisees for the best seats and the greetings. You know, we read in, in Luke 11, verse 43, that the Pharisees love the best seats and they love to get the greetings. Well, that's agape. So I don't think we can restrict agape to this special, sacrificial, you know, love of God. It's used very, very broadly. Now, the word philia or filio, uh, like I say, it basically means to be fond, uh, to have affection, to have friendship. Uh, we get our our English word philanthropic, um, meaning that we have a, a care, we have an affection for our fellow man. And it's used in scripture in this way in, in regard uh, to fondness or friendship. And one of the most interesting places where I believe you get this, this playoff between agape and filio is in John chapter 21. Now, again, there's several different interpretations of this. Um, some people believe that actually you can't make a big deal about the different original words that are used. It, it's just, it all just melts together. It doesn't matter. Um, I actually believe God specifically inspired the use of, of specific words for a reason. So I believe there is a reason. And when you go to John chapter 21, you, you'll remember this story where Jesus has risen and he appears to, to the disciples and he's now talking to Peter. And Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? It's agape. So he's saying to, saying to Simon Peter, do you agape me? More, more than these. And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But he uses filio. Okay. I'll, I'll carry on and then I'll just come back to that in a moment. So he says, feed my lambs. Verse 16, Jesus says to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? Do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love, you know that I filio you. And he said, feed my sheep. The third time, verse 17, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? But this time, Jesus uses the word filio, not agape. He says, Peter, do you filio me? Peter was grieved because he'd said to him a third time, do you filio me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I filio you. I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So why does Jesus in the first two times use agape, not filio? And why, particularly in those first two times, but of course, all three times, does Peter reply with filio? I believe that there's definitely something that, that we can learn from this. And like I say, uh, different commentators ha have a different spin on this. Um, so it's not easy to, to pin it down, but this is my take on it. So I believe Jesus is graciously um, progressing here. And he's starting off by saying to Peter, Peter, do you love me? You know, do you do you have a, a general love for me? Because that, that's how agape is used. He doesn't go straight in and say, do you filio me? Because I see filio here as a higher type of love. Remember, filio means 
a, an affection, a friendship, a fondness. And to me, that goes beyond just a general love for. So what I believe Jesus is doing, he's saying to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Just generally. And Peter, remember, he's betrayed Jesus three times. He, he felt really bad about that on the day that he did it. It says he went out and wept bitterly. So there's been a major change go on in Peter. And he responds not just by saying, Lord, yes, you know that I agape. He responds by basically wanting to express to Jesus, Lord, I don't just love you. I have an affection. I have a fondness. You know, I really love you. So that's the way I read that. So Jesus, in the second time, and, and in Scripture, where you get two or three things repeated, it's always for, for effect, for emphasis. So I believe Jesus, to seal the deal, you know, second time asks it again. Peter, the second time, he uses the word filio. And then the third time, Jesus raises the bar. And it's as if he's saying, Peter, so you've said to me, you don't just love me, but you actually have an, a, an affection, a deep affection for me. Well, Peter, do you really have a deep affection for me? And that's what I think made Peter feel, you know, a bit grieved, as it says there. But Peter re responds again, yes, Lord, you know that I fully owe you. So for me, this is like a progression. Jesus is taking Peter through a, a progression on how he is going to express this love. Like I say, different commentators have a different take on that. I'm not being adamant that that's the correct interpretation, but that's that's the way I read that. Thanks for that, John. So how do we seek to have the love of God for our Lord and each other? Well, it's a matter of being up and doing, isn't it? You know, we, we discussed a little earlier the two great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor um, as yourself. Um, so it's about keeping the commandments. It's about ob obedience. Yeah, it um, makes me think, John, of that scripture in Philippians 2, verse 2 to 4, and it says, um, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It kind of goes along with the theme of, you know, putting yourself third, God first, others second, and ourselves third. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's very well put. And, you know, First John 5 verse 3 says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You see, remember, we're talking about the fruit of the spirit here. We're talking about things that come from God's spirit. We're not expecting ourselves to generate this sort of love by our own nature. That's never that's never going to happen. Don't ever think that's the way to do this. It must be God's spirit. We must be born. You know, remember, Jesus said, unless you're born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. So we got born of water when we got baptized, but we've got to be born of spirit. We've got to have God's Holy Spirit within us, enabling us to do this. So, you know, the two commandments, keeping those and you know, don't forget as well, and to me, it's, it's about knowledge being power. You know, when you know, especially when it comes to loving our brethren, which can be difficult at times, you got to remember in John 15, you know, Jesus says there, you didn't choose me, I chose you. So all of our brethren, Jesus specifically chose to be our brethren. He called them. He brought them into the church. And it's none of our business whether we think we like them or not, or whether we think they're not worthy or not. 
Now, I'm not talking about gross things that might happen in the church, like a, adultery or whatever, where you know there needs to be a separation. I'm just talking talking about general day to day church life. When some people might rub you up the wrong way, maybe say something that you know they didn't think and maybe it offended you. Well, remember Jesus chose them to be in the church. And you know what else? And we've we've discussed this before as well. First Corinthians eleven says there must be divisions. What? There must be divisions in the church to show those who are approved. And if there's not these sorts of tests, how does our grace? get developed. You you cannot show grace if there's not an offense to show grace over. So, you know, when you know these things, I think it makes it a lot easier to to love people and remember as well what we started off saying in our discussion today. This is fundamental to salvation. You, You cannot love God. You cannot be in God's kingdom unless we love each other. So it is a matter of really digging in and applying that knowledge in action. So John, does and should our love be seen? Yeah, it's another good question. You know, some of us might think, well, you know, I I love people, but, you know, I'm not going to show it. They don't need to know. Well, when I was preparing this, I found um, a really good scripture that I believe God gave me for this. And it's in Proverbs 27, verse 5. And it says, open rebuke is better than secret love. I'm going to read it to you from the ISV. And open rebuke is better than unspoken love. And I thought, wow, that just sort of sums it up, doesn't it? You know, love shouldn't be unspoken. It shouldn't be secret. Now, we don't have to go up to someone and say, I love you. Okay, you don't have to necessarily do that. But we should be able to show our love to people in action. You know, 1 Corinthians 13, I think we all know it well. Uh, It's often referred to as the love chapter in the Bible, and there are a lot of verbs in there. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is never envious or arrogant with pride. She is never rude. She never thinks just of herself or ever gets annoyed. She is never resentful. Love is never glad with sin. She's always glad to side with truth and pleased the truth will win. She bears up under everything, believes the best in all. There is no limit to her hope and never will she fail. Love never fails. So there's a lot of things there that if we're genuinely showing the love of God, then by default, our love must be seen. Love has to be seen in action. And 1 John 3 from verse 18 sums this up as well. It says, little children, we must stop expressing love merely by our words and manner of speech. We must love also in action and in truth. Well, that nails it, doesn't it? This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and how we will be able to keep ourselves strong in his presence. I just want to read that verse 18 again. Stop expressing love merely by words. We must also show our love in action and in truth. And verse 24 of that same chapter, the person who keeps his commandments abides in God, and God abides in him. This is how we can be sure that he remains in us He has given us his spirit. So again, there's that emphasis there on keeping God's commandments. It's a commandment to love God with all our heart. It's a commandment to love others, especially our brethren, as ourself. And that raises another little, a little side, because I've noticed, you know, people who find it 
perhaps harder to love others don't really love themselves because that scripture says, you know, love others as you love yourself. Now, I'm not talking about loving ourselves and I'm the greatest and look at me and, you know, in a proud way. The Bible uses that phrase, you know, in just a general way because we do care about ourselves. You know, we, we love ourselves. We preserve ourselves in danger. You know, we do things to, to look after our health, to make sure that we're okay. So there's inbuilt in us, you know, this love, which isn't wrong, but this love for ourself. So the Bible is saying, love others that way. But, you know, sometimes, you know, we might not be a self-harmer. We might not have sort of maybe, you know, gone to that, to that level. But sometimes maybe because of our upbringing or maybe we're just born not, not a very confident sort of person, we can be a person that really struggles with our own self-esteem, you know, with our own love for ourselves. And I, I mean that in a, in a positive way. And therefore, because we're struggling with ourselves, it's very difficult to translate that love that we don't even have for ourselves onto others. So, you know, if you're in that position, then know this, God loves you and you can love yourself. You are loved by God. And if you can come to terms with that, then it will empower you more to love others as well. Thanks, sir, John. So what is the opposite of love? Would the obvious answer be hate? Yeah, that would probably be the, the sort of most obvious thing to say. The, the obvious to love is, is to hate. Um, but maybe it's not quite as simple as that. Um, Luke 14, verse 26, Jesus says, If any man come to me and hate not, his father and mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that word hate there, because you might read that and think, well, I thought we we're supposed to love everyone. Now Jesus is saying we've got to hate them. Well, that word hate there in the original Greek is a word that basically means to love less. In other words, he's saying, you know, if you come to me, You've got to love less your wife, your mother, your father, even your own life. In other words, you have to love me more. And I think the opposite to this love that we're, that we're looking to get, the love for God and the, the love for each other, is actually to love less. In other words, we may say that we love God, right? But do we love him less than we love ourselves or even our own will? You know, a very simple example, Sunday morning, it's time to go to church, you know, to show our love for God by praising him, to fulfill the commandment, to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. But on a Sunday, do we go bike riding instead because we love bike riding? You see what I mean? So we can say we love God, but if we love him less than other things, to me, that's the opposite of this true love. Because we don't necessarily hate God. We don't. We don't hate God, but we're actually not putting him on the level. We're not giving him the number one love that we should be, be giving him. And as you said before, Lenore, love God first love others second, and then we can get a look in after that. <laughs> um, John, I just did have one thought in regards to that as well, and that was just around the line of um, forgiveness. Um, so like in First Peter 4 verse 8, it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Whereas like in Proverbs 10, 12, it says hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. So to cover sin is to forgive it, and forgiveness is associated with love. And, of course, we have the best example of love covering sin, you know, through Jesus' sacrificial death. 
Um, and it just, just a final scripture I had was in Colossians 3, verse 12 to 14, where it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Uh, that's good, good, Lenore, very good. You, you wouldn't have um, that little word for today handy on yeah, your phone that you grab. Yeah, I, I just want to share sort of in closing, um, because as I, I mentioned earlier, my wife and I have got COVID and sort of suffering a bit with that. So it was a bit touch and go whether we were going to make it on the soapbox today, but we're sort of leaving that decision uh, as long as possible to hopefully sort of be able to do it. Here we are, praise praise God. Um, but I, I said to Lenore, um, yep, yep, we're going to sort of box on and, and and try and do it. You know, we're talking about love. And Lenore bounced back to me and uh, she, she's come up with this phrase, layering. Um, in other words, the way God confirms, you know, it says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, he will confirm a matter. And you'll notice in God sometimes how he will give you a scripture on a certain subject and then you'll talk to a brother and he'll give you confirmation exactly the same way. You know, you get this confirmation um, and Lenore's come up with this, this uh, word, uh, calling it layering, which I quite, quite like. So anyway, I said to Lenore, you know, we're going to box on, we're going to do it. And Lenore subscribes on an app on her phone uh, I think it's called Word for Today or something like that, where um, she will get a little little Christian message each day. And if you had that there handy, you can just sh share that with us, Lenore. That would be I really do. good. Yes. Yeah, so I, I shared with John this message this morning. I said, well, brother, I said, this will give you some encouragement. <laughs> and this is what it said. Um, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another, First John 3.11. So the thoughts on today's verse, the original message, love one another. The enduring message, love one another. The most convicting message, love one another. The most difficult message, love one another. I'm reminded of the little verse, to dwell above the saint, with saints we love, oh, that will be the glory but to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's another story. But it's the story we're called to write with our lives. This is God's enduring message he wants demonstrated in his children. Let's go out and live it. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Lenore. So, you know, God was definitely speaking today and uh, definitely wanted us to be talking about love by confirming it. I mean, you know, when you when you think of the myriads of different angles, the different Bible topics that you know it, it could have been for today, happened to be the exact same one we were talking about. So, yeah, hope, hopefully everyone's been ministered to. And you know, as it said in that little saying, Lenore, it's not easy because we're we're fighting the flesh, we're we're fighting uphill. Um, but hey, you know, I often think. You know, what are we fighting for? We're fighting for eternity. We're fighting for eternal life. You know, isn't that worth fighting for? And, you know, in scripture, it makes no apology for that. It says, he who overcomes will I give. You read about that in the, in the message to the churches. So there's no question. It's a battle, but we, we can overcome by the spirit of God. Again, don't ever think you've just got to do this, you know, with your own fleshly strength. It's got to be a work of God's Holy Spirit. And the amazing thing is, Jesus says, you know, if you ask for bread, you know, a father doesn't give a, a stone. So your heavenly father, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he will give it to you. So it's something we can pray for. And it's something that we can press into God for more. But remember, and I think we might have talked about this last week as well. It's something we have to exercise. And there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, that says the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. 
And what that scripture is saying is, because in, in the context it's talking about tongues and how that even if you've got the gift of tongues, you've got a choice whether you exercise it. So even having God's Holy Spirit, and we all, we all have it, we all have access to it, it's subject to us. In other words, we have to choose to exercise it. We have to choose to say, you rotten, dastardly flesh nature, you're not winning this time around. God's spirit is winning and make that choice. So, you know, that's the challenge. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Lenore, again. And um, what we'll do now is uh, we'll break bread together if everyone's sort of prepared for that. And uh, Joseph, uh, sorry, I didn't prepare you for this, but would you be available to give thanks for the bread and the wine for us? Sure. Um, <clears throat> dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you uh, today uh, and um, we, uh, we want to remember uh, specifically uh, about your love, uh, which was today's uh, topic and how it relates uh, to this memorial of uh, the bread and the wine and uh, and how um, how we need to get uh, close to you and to Jesus and to learn from you, Father, uh, to learn your love, Father, to learn all that you did for us through Jesus, Father. Um, help us appreciate uh, your love, Father, uh, which um, sometimes we we may not appreciate your love, Father, and we need to really, really appreciate your love, Father, and feel that love and understand that love through Christ Jesus, Father. And um, we uh, we come to you right now, and um, we uh, we remember Jesus. Um, sacrifice uh giving his life his body uh which is representative of the, of the bread and the blood father um jesus blood he he died for us father because he loved us he had your love and he had that love for us father and um we come and and we just with all humility father um uh, ask you uh, to help us just appreciate that love and exercise that love as well, Father, while we take this bread and wine. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Joseph. All right, let's uh, remember the Lord and the bread and wine. 